Two common uses of a voltage divider circuit structure are switch circuits and LED circuits. So now we'll look at some basic examples of each. I'll start with switches. Switches are devices that involve little physical bits of metal that are moving in and out of contact. So let's look at one symbol here. If I draw these two circles and a throw, the the symbol replicates the physical structure. There's two bits of metal and then some other bit of metal that can be placed to connect them, uh, effectively shorts them out. And this is what we might call a, a single pole, single throw push button switch. And the special properties are that when it's open, which is the state where it's not in contact, it effectively has infinite resistance and no current flows. And when it's closed, meaning the parts are in contact, then it effectively has zero resistance or very low physical resistance. There's actually bits of metal touching, and so there's always some finite resistance, but for most of our purposes, that's, we can consider it zero. Another switch character, uh, structure that we care a lot about would be the single pole double switch. Um, physically, if you have uh, three contacts and a bit of metal that could move back and forth to one of the other states, uh, you might imagine connecting the center terminal to the left or the right, but not both. Um, the actual schematic symbol it uh, involves three terminals and then this uh, pole that can move between them. And so you draw it in one state or the other. And so this is what we call a single pole double throw switch. And in Tinkercad and the kits, there are physical switches, often slide switches, that, that implement this topology. And they have three terminals. Um, sometimes the only way to figure out which terminals are which are to use a meter to actually measure resistances, or sometimes they're labeled. So both of these have these nice properties that they have uh, two well-known states and the resistances vary between effectively zero and effectively infinity. So one common question here is how can I wire a switch into an Arduino to use it as some kind of sensor or user input? So here I'm just going to sort of draw the Arduino as a box and think of some input on it. So here's a really common mistake I see. Um, starting from the 5 volt supply, which is typical in these circuits, if I simply take a push button switch and I wire it directly into some in input on the on Arduino, I have a two-state system. It's either open or closed. Let's first think about what happens when the switch is closed. I push the button, the five volts is connected to the input, and I get a uh, five volt signal, which will be read as some like one or digital high. Let's think about the second state, which was I open the switch and allow it to disconnect. Then this problem occurs where the D2 line is no longer connected. We call it floating. It's not connected to any other circuit element. So no current will flow on it. And in truth, it'll have some voltage, voltage that reflects just the ambient static charge left on the wire. And in practice, it ends up being kind of indeterminate and flaky. Sometimes this will float high for a while, then randomly go low. Um, it usually causes unexpected problems in the overall operation. So that's not a really a desirable state for a well-engineered system. So one way to fix this is to add a resistor. And this is our most common uh, solution and one that I recommend. If I now take this D2 terminal and I add a resistor uh, to ground, let's just say 10K, now I have a determinate system. When the switch is closed, the 5 volts uh, will flow through the, the switch. Um, there's a current through the resistor. It is part of now a voltage divider, um, but it's low and the D2 input will see the full 5 volt supply voltage. Um, when I open the switch, effectively any residual charge left from that D2 will now flow through the resistor to ground, and D2 will now uh, achieve a, like a reliable zero volts and have a reliable state. In this case, we would call this a pull down resistor, because it's pulling the voltage down to ground, down to zero. And this is, if I simply, this I've drawn now, if I draw it again in, is more in a, in a sequence, I can think about the 5 volts um, through a switch, through my resistor, to ground, and this as the V out terminal from our previous uh, our voltage divider discussion. At least drawn this way, it looks more like the voltage divider circuit um, that we analyzed before. And we can go back and look at the voltage divider relation. This is effectively R1, this is R2, and um, the voltage on the, on the Arduino, the D2 voltage here, will be R2 over R1 plus R2 times the supply, which in this case is 5 volts. So that would be the, that would be the V out. And if we just think here, if uh, R1 is 
zero, then uh, R2 over R2 is simply one. In that case, we are getting the supply voltage of five. When R1 is infinity, then we have this infinite term in the denominator. And so of course the fraction goes to approach zero and V out will be zero. So we can see the result algebraically. This is what we might conserve term positive logic or maybe simply plain logic in that the voltage will be zero when the switch is unactuated and when the switch is actuated, it becomes five volts or positive. And so in programming terms, there's a simple relationship where the, the low signal, the zero is off and the one is on. If we simply wire them in the opposite order, we get, the, we get an inverse logic. So just to draw that, if I take my five volt supply plus five volts, move you into view here, and I wire a resistor on the upper leg of the divider, and I put my switch on the lower leg of the divider to ground. It works perfectly fine, but we have an opposite logic. Now when the switch is unactuated, when it's open, not pressed, then no current can flow to ground, and then the Arduino input here uh, will achieve the five volt supply voltage. So in this case, off or unpressed will produce a high voltage or a one. And so the logic might be said to be inverted. This is how it actually turns out to be you know, easy to deal with in code and actually a very common circuit topology. When the switch is pressed, then this resistance of the switch goes to zero and the, the, any current through the resistor is shunted to ground. The voltage across that switch has to be zero because it has zero resistance. So then D2 will be low. So in this case, active or pressed will produce a zero voltage or a zero. And that's why you say this is called inverse logic. Again, this is actually very common to do in circuits. It's a common way to do things. In this case, now we call the resistor a pull-up resistor because it, it is in the inactive state pulling up the voltage on D2. So there's a similar sort of relationship that happens with LEDs, but first we have to talk briefly about what is an LED. LEDs appear in all sorts of devices, in your displays, in your screens, in your flashlights, um, and in indicators. We're gonna use uh, individual discrete LEDs. These are, there's a three millimeter and a couple of five millimeter packages. An LED is a two terminal device that has resistance, but is not a resistor. It has some special properties. And of course, when current goes through it about sufficient magnitude, the energy of the current is translated directly into light and it gets some kind of output. Inside that is a tiny, tiny semiconductor circuit embedded in the plastic <clears throat> that actually creates the light. And that's what we care about, it's a diode. So let's look at the symbol for an LED. An LED has a symbol which is directional. It's kind of like a little arrow with a triangle and a line. And uh, typically, sometimes there's a, some little arrows pit uh, on the symbol to reflect that light comes out. The essential property of a diode is it only conducts one direction. It has a positive side called the anode and a negative side called the cathode. And effectively, when, volt, when current passes through it in the correct direction, it'll glow. And if voltage is applied in the reverse direction, what we call reverse biased, it won't glow. And actually, almost no current will flow. Just to show what that looks like, I'm going to draw a tiny graph here of the current in the device as a function of the voltage on the device. Now, Ohm's law is this empirical relationship between the current and the voltage across some thing. For a linear resistor, it, it turns out, like a common piece of material or an engineered resistor, this relationship is, R is effectively constant, and so there's a, there's a line that is formed. So for some resistance value, as the voltage increases, the current goes up linearly with the, with the voltage. And that property holds over the range that we care about. A diode has a different property. When the voltage is negative on it, when it's reverse bias, the current just stays at zero. When the voltage starts to climb, it, it sort of stays zero a little bit, and then it starts to climb, and it quickly climbs in, an, in a kind of uh, exponential curve. And so when the voltage increases across the LED, the current can uh, increase sort of over a very narrow range, kind of linearly, and it gets brighter. But then as the voltage increases beyond that point, the current can increase very quickly. And effectively, the, the resistance goes to, goes to a very low value as the voltage increases. For this reason, there's a kind of uh, straightforward mistake to make, which is you take, your, you take your voltage source, 
let's say, let's just say we have a beautiful, perfect five volt voltage source, and I wire it directly across a red LED, basically the LED will explode. The LED will see a voltage that's way up its exponential curve. It'll try to connect a huge amount of current. The resistance is very low at that point. Lots of energy will flow through the LED. It'll flash brightly and then melt. So this is, this is not a good idea. Um, the exact voltage at which that will happen depends a lot upon the device. The, the, the voltage of the LED, the sort of knee point on the curve, depends upon the chemistry of the semiconductors, which is closely related to the color. So I said red LED because traditional red LEDs have an op a good operating voltage, kind of around 1.6 to 1.8 volts. Blue LEDs can be substantially higher. There are blue LEDs that run kind of 3 to 3.5 volts, where that, where that curve has a good operating point. For our LEDs, I think sticking around that 1.6 volt value with a current no more than 20 milliamps is uh, a desirable point that will get you get reliable operation. 20 milliamps is like a typical working limit. And if you go higher than that, the lifespan is reduced. If you go much higher than that, it melts. So like, once again, what's a good idea for fixing this problem? And it turns out, at, again, add a resistor. So in this case, if I go back and I take my 5 volt supply, and now I create another voltage divider where I put what we call a ballast resistor in series with my LED, right, plus minus, um, then current can flow through the LED, but the properties of the circuit will change. So let's just, just to argument's sake, let's pick a value here. I'm going to say uh, 330 ohms, because that would be typical for this arrangement. And let's say it's an, a red LED with that 1.6 volt uh, drop in the kind of typical operating point. So if we want to design a circuit and think about like this operating point, what we do know from Kirchhoff's voltage law is that if the voltage across the LED has achieved 1.6 volts, then we're going to have a 3.4 volt drop across the resistor because the total sum has to equal this 5 volt supply. With that, we can then go ahead and write out the current, which is we can look at the resistor. The resistor has a, a known voltage across it and a known resistance value. And so the resistance, um, we start with V equals IR. The resistance is going to be the, um, I'm sorry, I got, I got it backwards. The current is going to be the voltage divided by the resistance. So if we take 3.4 volts and divide it by 330 ohms, we get approximately 10 milliamps, which will glow with medium brightness and be well within the kind of safe operating range. Oops, there you go. Now you can see it. It's be well within the safe operating range of the device. So here's a case where by adding resistor, we effectively add a very simple voltage regulator, which allows the LED to reach an equilibrium within its operating characteristics and uh, limits the total current. There's a similar uh, kind of setup here regarding the polarity or the, in the logic of the, of the device. If I have an Arduino output or other kind of circuit output, um, I, got, I have two choices for how to wire it up. I can take my ballast resistor, we're just going to write it as 330 to drive that point home, and I can do what I did before and take the LED uh, and wire it to ground. And this way we have what we think of as, as positive logic. When the output turns on, current can flow, and the LED lights up. But it's equally valid to do inverse logic. So I take my, uh, my I'm going to just label these here, so it's something. Take my output from my Arduino, and I run it through my ballast resistor. And now, instead of going to ground, I wire the LED to the plus, plus 5 supply. Note that the direction of the LED is still pointing in the direction of the current for this to work. But now I have what we might think of as inverse logic. When the D3 output is in the high state, the LED is off. Basically, the voltage across the resistor and the LED will all be, there'll be no current because at one end of the circuit's 5 volts, at the other end is 5 volts, and no current will flow between them. Now when we drive the D3 output to a low voltage, then we have a voltage differential across our bridge. Current will flow through the LED and the resistor, and they'll light up. So in the first case, a high is, means on. In the second case, a high means off. And both of these are equally valid solutions. Um, you'll very commonly see each of them in the kind of common circuits that we use. So just to recap, we are looking at different ways that adding a controlled resistance, specifically an actual resistor, into a circuit either stabilizes it or gets it to function properly. Just the walk-away heuristic would be uh, always use a pull-up or pull-down resistor with your switch if you're trying to drive a digital input
in order to get well-controlled voltages in all states. And the second heuristic would be always use a ballast resistor in series with your LED in order to limit the currents that it might see.